Hello and welcome to another movie review here on HSG and for this one I'm wearing my custom personally made Black Mountain Side t-shirt, one of two that I made for myself and the reason why that is pertinent is because it's from the same writer, director and team and even has some of the same actors in the movie as well as Black Mountain Side. Now for those who haven't watched Black Mountain Side, if you're a fan of the kind of movies that I review, especially the horror stuff and the more independent and undervalued ones, do yourself a favour and watch that movie. If you like The Babadook, if you like The Thing, you'll probably at least like quite a bit of Black Mountain Side. I love the movie. A lot of people don't, and I think some people just like to hate on things for the sake of it. I love that film. It's probably my top five favourite horror flicks to re-watch, in fact. Now, that, I will fully admit, puts me in a position where I want this movie to succeed, because I'm a fan of the previous work, and in a funny kind of way, that puts me in a similar position to how I felt going into Mud Midsommar after watching Ari Aster's Hereditary. I adore Hereditary. I hated Midsommar. <laughs> and although I didn't hate this movie... Much like Midsommar, it's a movie where there's quite a lot of things that I do like in terms of how it was made or what is shown or certain scenes. I didn't love the overall packaging and production and end result as much as I did that other film. So for me, Black Mountain Side is still by far my favourite of his work, out of these two at least. But this one, I think, actually is superior to Black Mountain Side in a couple of more production-based ways. In terms of the overall film itself, not so much. If you're clicking on this review, chances are you've probably looked at something like a rundown. But for those who haven't, it's basically about a small indie band who've had some success, like a one-hit wonder kind of scenario, who have gone out canoeing and camping. They meet up with another couple of girls, take one of them along, and basically are there to have uh, a drug-related experience to hopefully help them with their music. And then they begin to see things in the woods, archons, <laughs> and uh, have to figure out are they real or not. And the great thing about what I just said is that doesn't spoil anything, because regardless of whether or not they're real, you still need someone in a suit to portray that. So that's the essential idea. It's a simple enough concept. I like the concept. It's certainly similar to other things which we've heard before. Uh, there are maybe some elements of shrooms in there, that movie, which I found very forgettable, to be honest, and even something like Yellow Brick Road, which I hated the ending of, but for some reason reminds me of some of the vibe of this movie, wherein it's very colourful and brightly lit and almost has this more personal impromptu kind of vibe to it and I kind of like that about this one as well but much like Yellow Brick Road I think the ending will probably make or break it for a lot of people. Now for me I would say that one of the key ways in which this one is superior is the characters. I like the characters in Black Mountain Side but one of the issues that I said in my review was that some of the line delivery and some of the acting is a little wooden and that isn't necessarily completely gone from a movie like this. I'm not saying that they're like Oscar-worthy performances, but I do think that they felt more realistic. The banter and the chemistry feels more accurate. Some people would probably say that they still feel a little bit wooden. Having spent time around plenty of millennials, I can say that they do talk like they do in this movie, so it's actually pretty accurate to real life. And... I like the characters. I like the way they're shown. I like the brief but kind of vibing introductions that they're given. You kind of get a feel for what that character probably likes, dislikes, what they're going to be like throughout the movie. And for the most part, they kind of stick to that. You can feel certain rifts between them, certain relationships building or whatever the opposite of building would be, breaking down, I guess. And it fulfills that. The main issue I have with the film, actually, is that it's not long enough. <laughs> and that might seem like a very strange criticism because a lot of the reviews out there, I've checked out IMDb, and a lot of the reviews are saying that they really don't like this film. I could understand why you would say that, and I'm going to get more into that side of things into the spoiler section over here of the video. But to keep it non-spoiler for the moment, the two primary issues that I have with the film are the one that I just mentioned, that it's not long enough, and I'll explain the reason why. The movie takes about 35 to 40 minutes to fully horror. And one of the key inspirations for the movie is Deliverance. And you can feel that. In terms of the setting and the tone and the pacing in particular, it's more like Deliverance. The content, not so much. You know, there's no squeal for me boy kind of stuff going on here. But I could certainly feel that. 
and not necessarily just even Deliverance. It kind of has that almost 60s and 70s horror vibe wherein it takes its time. You know, when a stranger calls, don't look now, Deliverance, that kind of pacing can be very effective. However, when it takes about 40 minutes to get into the horror fully, which is great for fleshing out characters, I was actually really enjoying those first 40 minutes. It was well lit, it looked gorgeous, the character playoffs of each other were cool. It, I forgot, actually, that it was a horror movie for a while. But then, you've only got about another 40 minutes to get everything else done. You've got to fully horror. You've got to scare people. You've got to get the gore in there. You've got to, at least to some degree, kind of give inklings or explanations as to the mythology, how they beat it or don't beat it, and with probably some kind of twist or hook of an ending, as horror movies usually do. That's a lot to do in 40 minutes. And the problem which this movie has, I think, is it's a little bit too ambitious for its time, <laughs> in terms of the length. It needs more time to really get into the story. I would have no problem if this was another 10, 15, even 20 minutes long, as long as that was the second half that was longer. Because the commonality between the movies that I mentioned, such as Deliverance, When a Stranger Calls, The Brood, even something like that, is they're super small ideas. So you can take a long time to get going, and you'll still have enough time to finish the movie, because they're mostly character or human-based horror. If The Thing took 40 minutes to just tell you about MacReady and Doc and all the rest of them, and then you've only got 30-40 minutes left to actually Thing, it would be a very different movie. And I think that's one of the issues here. In fact, probably even the main issue for me is that the second half feels a little rushed, in terms of, like, here's the creature, here's what they can do, blah, 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 blah. The second thing brings me to the creatures, and I'm going to get more into this in the spoiler section, but to me, this movie could have benefited a lot from following the Black Mountainside School of Shadows. And what I mean by that is, less is sometimes more. And that's not necessarily just a criticism of small independent films like this one. I happen to think that the xenomorphs in Alien look pretty ridiculous when you see them in the sunlight. In, for instance, Alien... whatever that more recent one was called that wasn't very good. Where you see the alien on the outside of the ship, spit flying everywhere in the wind. It looks ridiculous, not just because it's CGI, but even in something like AVP or Requiem, as everyone loves, they look like bobbleheads bobbling around in rubber suits. That's an issue. But it's not an issue with low lighting and a lot of shadow. In Black Mountainside, for instance, the kind of spoiler alert deer god is basked in shadow a lot of the time. And that was very effective. Because the one time that it's not as effective is when you're very close up to it and you can see it better. The rest of the time it's cool. It's freaky to see a deer standing up on its back legs, almost backlit by the darkness in a weird kind of way. And it's effective. These creatures could have benefited a lot from that because there's only so much you can do with a suit. You can get like a six foot seven guy like they did in Alien or Predator and it, it can work. But again, Predator, you don't see it much. Alien, you see it even less and that's why it's effective. In this movie, there are fully lit, close up shots of the creatures and it just doesn't work for me because the proportions are off. Hands are too big, heads are too big. It looks awkward <laughs> sometimes and I've seen the concept art for the creatures as well and it's interesting enough but I think there are just some creatures that lend themselves towards darkness and I would have liked to have seen that but again I could talk about that kind of filmmaking side for a while now I'm going to talk more about the ending now as we get into the spoiler section of the review so if you haven't watched the movie end this video now check it out and perhaps patax perhaps come back so that ending. I'm going to talk about the creatures a little bit more in a second, but let's talk about the ending first. The ending being ambiguous to some degree, or maybe it was just me seeing it that way, I think is a perfectly acceptable idea. I like movies that don't have happy endings, I like movies that kind of turn things topsy-turvy on you, and I like ambiguous endings quite a bit. I actually like writing tragedy, for instance, in my two novellas, Buddy and Spore. I like them to be not necessarily happy stories. They certainly are inspired, as I am in most of my horror things, very much by Korean and French horror. They are unforgiving. I like that. It's horror, after all. What the ending immediately made me think after finishing the movie is one of three theories. There's the drug theory, 
there's the delusion theory, and there's the supernatural theory. Now, I'm sure there are other theories out there, and maybe it's not as complicated as I'm thinking, because I only watched the movie last night, and now I'm doing the review today, so if I watched it again, for instance, doubtless I would get different things out of it, but I tend to watch a lot of the movies that I review once, think about it for a while, and then review it, so that's the same standard that I'm using. So... Theory number one is the drug theory, because, of course, at the end of the movie, you see, uh, what's his name, Michael Dixon, from the first movie, The Professor, who's got him in the truck at the end, and they come across a car crash, and he recognises the characters. And I could kind of see uh, the actress, or actor, I guess, these days, on the bonnet of the car, looked like she had frizzy hair, like the girl whose head exploded earlier on in the film. And then the guy on the floor is his friend, I believe. And that immediately made me think of these couple of different theories. So the drug theory is that maybe it was all just a car crash and everything else was a trip, kind of like limbo. That would make sense to some degree. Where it doesn't make sense is why he would have a bandage on his head. Because if he was under the influence of drugs, well, now you've got to ask a couple of subsequent questions. Was he driving the car? Is this playing on the idea of guilt, like the machinist? Or is it just a pure drug trip from a passenger? Well, okay, if he's having a drug trip, why were the, all, why were the other people thrown from the car? He wasn't, he doesn't seem particularly injured, whereas they're all crumpled and mangled all over the place. So he doesn't seem like the kind of character who would be wearing a seatbelt when the others aren't. So how is he fine when they're not? Is he already dead? Well, in that case, that doesn't really explain how he can interact with the guy in the truck. Is he already dead? Is everyone in the movie dead? <laughs> so, certain things don't really match up about that theory. Second theory is delusion. This is similar to the first, but maybe it's more down the machinist route, less about the drugs, and just guilt, where he's created this scenario in his mind and kind of wandered down the road until this guy picked him up. Again, you come, up, you come up against the same issues, as I just said. The bandage on the head. If you're that discombobulated and potentially high or having a bad trip, you're not going to be wrapping up your own head. And the others are dead, so who did it? So that doesn't really work from what I can tell. The third thing is my favourite theory. This is the supernatural one. This theory actually ties more into the yellow brick road kind of idea, wherein the atmosphere or the situation that the characters are in can actually manipulate them, or the characters within it can, so reality can be warped for the sake of the storytelling. This is my favourite because it's by far the most interesting and also fits in with the rest of the movie. If these archons, which is a term meaning like a demonic underling, which is certainly what they come off as, almost like imps sometimes, and I'm going to talk about the creatures more in a second, like I said, but if these creatures are in fact real, which I happen to believe they are, I think that they are manipulating what he is seeing in the crash. My theory for the movie is everything happened exactly as it was shown, but the crash is being manipulated. So he is seeing the faces of his friends when they're in fact not there. Now that could be wrong, but to me that suits the film the most. And that suits the kind of tone which we've seen. Now I like the fact that you could argue either way. And I'm sure there are other small nitpicky things here and there, or maybe even to do with things that I've just said that you could pick apart or maybe rebut. But those, as I said, were the first three things that came to mind for me. And my favourite explanation is the supernatural one just suits the film i think now to move on to the creatures as i said i saw the concept art to me the concept art is interesting but looks more like something that i'd see in a game rather than a movie like a you know faceless underling that you shoot down hordes of in the movie i said as much earlier on in the video i think there are just certain parameters in which they don't work the heads are very big the hands are very big they're kind of gangly looking and the way they move, the way the actors move, the way the human body can move, unless you get a contortionist, you're very limited. And that's one of the reasons why, if I were to ever adapt my second book, Spore, I would specifically cast a contortionist to be the creature, because it demands that. That's what it requires. And if you combine something like a contortionist with a very tight-fitting minimal suit and a lot of shadow, well, that could be pretty terrifying, much like a xenomorph. 
In this one, I believe that they showed the creature in too much light. And also, there's something about having so many creatures that kind of makes them less intimidating to me. Maybe if the movie had been called Archon <laughs> instead, I might have liked that a little bit more. But to me, seeing like this group of creatures with, incidentally, the same voice actor as the Deer God in uh, Black Mountain Side, seeing more of them almost gave me Ewok vibes. <laughs> and I know that's not what they were going for. I think they were probably wanting more like a Predator vibe, which, again, is alluded to in the press kit regarding, you know, removing the mask but still not fully seeing the face. I can fully get behind that. But I just think the way the creatures were used could have been a little scarier because we see them almost too much. And you see them really quick. Once you start to see them, you see them a lot. Like they're just walking up to him, talking around him. He's kind of staring past them. Interesting idea once again, but... When you can just see the creature right there, it takes a lot of the mystique away. If you think, for instance, of a couple of my favourite horror movies, such as The First Alien and The Thing, you very rarely get to see the full creature. Uh, and when you do, it's not usually well lit. When you see Alien, it's in a passageway, kind of opening its six fingers at someone. When you see The Thing, it's the dog twisting its head around in the cage. Most of the time, it's not well lit, and you can't quite make out what its form is. I'm a huge fan of formless monsters. It, to me, it makes them so much better because your imagination does the rest. And that is one of the great things about Black Mountainside. Your imagination does a lot of it, and with fantastic sound design. In this one, it's almost a little bit more like how my second book compares to my first one. The first one is very psychological, the second one is a straight-up creature feature. In terms of this movie, this is way more of a creature feature than Black Mountainside is. But uh, I think that, for me, there's a combination of things that I do and don't like. There's nothing that I hated about the movie, but I definitely think that the two things I would have liked to have seen done either differently or see like a director's cut where they were different, like an extended cut, are A, that, extend the movie, give it more chance to fully horror, because, let's be honest... The creatures don't do much. <laughs> I mean, they grab the girl and pull her off. You never see what happens to her. That can be cool, but it, it didn't really feel... It felt too abrupt to me. Then they're bobbling around in the house. They also don't really do much. They hit the guy on the back of the head. That's kind of more like a slasher movie thing to do. And you just don't get to see the creature's creature. The creature gets killed by a rock to the head. So they established that it's not a particularly intimidating creature either. So I just would have liked to have seen the creatures used in a, in a different way. And it also reminded me, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, of a couple of other movies which I've also reviewed. One of them was called uh, Welp, I believe. It's like a German or Dutch movie about like a forest-dwelling killer who wears like a wooden mask. And the other one is The Hallow which also has, like, these woodland-dwelling creatures. That's an Irish horror film. Horrendous character choices in that one. But similar concept of, like, these keepers of the woods terrorizing people. And those two movies prove that you can do a lot with it. They're not perfect. Far from it. But you can do a lot with it. This movie, I think, could have done with certainly more of a budget. You could always say that. Definitely more runtime. And a lot more shadow. Because I think the situations and locations look fantastic. From the brightly lit, colourful beginning, with the, you know, the coloured water and all that kind of stuff, to even just the opening itself. I love the look of that. And then contrast that with just the torchlight moving around in the trees. That torch moving around in the trees is far more suspenseful than any of the creature stuff. Because it's the unknown. And when you see, for instance, the effect of the footsteps from the invisible creature moving towards him relatively early on in the film, where the grass is compressing in front of him, almost like the invisible predator. That, to me, was also cool and had more of an effect as seeing the creature inside the cabin moving around. Because they're demons. <laughs> and they don't come off like that. They come off more like imps, as I said. So those are my thoughts on Archons. I definitely prefer that name over Hammer of the Gods. 
I'm certainly more of a fan of Black Mountain Side, but I like a number of things that were done in this movie. I think it's just a couple of small tweaks that I would have personally liked from a you know director's cut or whatever. But uh, yeah, for the sake of not repeating myself any further, those are my thoughts. Tell me yours down below, and certainly check out the movie. Even more so, check out Black Mountain Side if you haven't already, and support Nick's work. I think he's got tons more potential in the writing and directing sphere, and I like plenty about both of his movies so far. But that's it overall for this review. Of course, I'll see you guys next time. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.